Chapter 10, Purchase Daybook, Purchase Ledger and Trade Payables Control Account. So the key points in this chapter are, the sales invoice for the seller is the same document for the purchaser. The purchaser calls this document a purchase invoice, but will renumber it so they can file the invoice. In manual systems, purchase invoices are added together in the Purchase Daybook and posted together to the General Ledger and Purchase Ledger. The payment terms date may be included in a digital system to give reminders of when to pay and highlight overdue payments. Customers are reminded for the need to pay through supplier statements and may highlight that they pay through maintenance advices. A company that's selling the item calls a, a transaction a sale. With the purchasing company, that transaction is called a purchase. The seller produces the sales invoice for their sales and gives it to the buyer. In the buyer's accounting system, that sales invoice for the seller is now called the purchase invoice for the buyer. It's the same document but called a sales invoice for the seller and a purchase invoice for the buyer. To place an order, the buyer will often give the seller a purchase order. They will include items such as a per order number to quote in future invoices to be provided. If you look back in chapter 9, you'll see an example of a purchase order. As with the sales datebook and ledgers, there are purchase datebooks and trade payables, your trade payables control account and purchase ledger for purchases. To allow the finance department to operate with different people all working at the same time and not attempting to post to the general ledger at the same time. So, in terms of a purchase daybook, a purchase daybook is completed from the purchase invoices for purchases made from the suppliers on credit terms. Purchases made for cash are included in the cash book, but will also have invoices for VAT purposes to allow the purchaser to recover input VAT. They may simply get a receipt. The purchase daybook sets out the money expected to be paid out and where that money will go in the general ledger. Not all of the purchase will eventually be deducted from the amounts to be paid from shareholders, so it's not always going to be all an expense. If the company buys an item for, say, £100, there may be purchase tax to be covered from the government at £20 if the VAT, is 20, VAT rate is 20% on the item. This would mean less of the amount payable for this purchase, £100, will have to be deducted from the amount that is payable to shareholders and it be, in, be in the purchase expense. However, the £20 VAT will be recovered from HMRC and therefore be available for payment to the future uh, to shareholders and not be an expense. This is an example of a purchase daybook. This purchase daybook has been posted weekly. The company will note the purchase invoices numbers from the sellers. So here's, here's the sales invoice numbers from the sellers, purchase invoice numbers for the buyers. Yeah. But the company will typically renumber this as well, and they'll provide their own number here. And that will allow the company to file. You may have to put this in an example, but I've not seen an example yet of where, where the, the real life sort of renumbering that a company does uh, is actually there. The reason why company will do that and then have sequential numbering as it means that they can file their order the, the invoices in, in, in a numerical order and be able to then go and recover them couldn't really go back and recover that there's no way to file on the basis of that in here and also it means that in missing what you can sort of scan through the sequential numbers and see if there's any gaps in caps in, uh, in the purchase purchase or numbers that's useful in, in an audit for a review for accruals you know all the missing invoices that have been sort of taken out so you can't see them the general posting of this purchase daybook is credit the purchase ledger control account or the, the trade payables control account 11604, so 11604. And we're going to debit this VAT control account 1934. And that's because we're going to get this back. This is going to be money coming back in, or you know, plus money to the company, a reduction in a money out item in here. So that's always quite useful. And the reason why, why the examiner likes to give sort of purchases on VAT going through a control account is that it gives them, it sort of allow, prevents you sort of using dead clicking in an exam. And then debit the expense here. So we can see here, although this is the total amount we're paying here, 11,604 to the supplier, we're going to get this back from the HM Revenue and Customs in here. This money, this money on VAT is going to, we're going to get back. So it's only the net amount that's going to be deducted from the amounts that we have to shareholders. And it's only made, that's the net purchase amount. Here. Now, what we've seen in terms of purchase invoices is the purchase invoice, as noted earlier, is simply a sales invoice from the supplier but held by the purchaser. It forms two functions. It sets out the information on goods or services sold by the company for, to them to pay. If the company does not know who to pay and when to pay, it, well, it's just not going to pay. And it provided a VAT document for the purchaser to reclaim any sales tax, such as VAT, that has been paid. 
if they're able to reclaim that, that tax. Significant advantages of, a, of a, uh, digital systems in recording purchase, purchase invoices is that they often allow you to go and reconcile that purchase invoice back to the initial order by item. So you can sort of cross them off and see whether you actually got everything, everything that you had. It's much easier to reconcile in a, in a digital system. In there. And often actually it will, it will, it will reconcile it itself sometimes, especially when you have things like, let's say blockchain or something like that, it's going to start to, start to link finance systems together. Payment dates can be inputted in a digital system. It can only be done in a manual system, you know, so you can input the payment dates as well to allow for later payment reports to give you suggested ideas of who we're going to pay today, who, who we actually owe, and who's to, who, if we don't pay these people today, then we're going to start breaching the credit terms. And then also as well, we can in a, in a digital system, we can scan the invoice. So we can scan the invoice on a, on, you know, on a scanner, usually attached to a photocopy, and really scan it and attach it uh, as a file to that, that purchase journal. As a manager then can sit at their desk and they can call up that call up that uh, what actually was behind that that journal. Especially useful if you know let's say the, the financial controller or the finance director wants to see what the managers have been buying rather than sort of having to flick through the purchase uh, the purchase sort of uh, invoice file there though and that taking a while you can just go through the the uh, uh, cost report flick up the um, flick up the invoice and go they spent what uh, so that's typically what how you do it as a finance director um, in terms of trade payables and, and early discounts, uh, you know, we've seen that in a, in a previous chapter as well, but that's, that's often when we use this sort of digital system to try and be able to, to make sure we've got the dates in there to take advantage of, 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 the, uh, of the prompt payment discounts. So although you've got the, the, the discounts, you've got trade discounts and bulk discounts because of you know, who you are in terms of whether you're in the trade or not, and bulk discounts and the amount that you're buying, they've already been deducted off the purchase invoice at the net, they've deducted before you get to the net amount that then has the VAT applied. Early payment discounts are not really not entered onto the sales invoice, but you might have payment terms on the sales invoice saying you know, a certain amount off for a particular particular date. And it'll be important to understand the prompt payment discount dates because yeah, you'll you'll often see exam questions on that. With respect to early payment discounts, it is worth considering why a company would offer such terms. When a company offers credits to a customer, it has to be able to afford that cash flow between its costs, you know, raw wage materials and you know, wages and all the rest of it, uh, the cost it's going to incur and when the customer decides to pay. Often the company has to borrow money from banks as an overdraft where it will pay interest on that money or it may not be able to raise the money at all and go bankrupt. So the company might offer a reduction for the price to be paid for early payment from its suppliers in order to reduce its interest costs. And, you know, and, and the debt, you know, and get its money in faster. Uh, we, you know, so maybe don't make a decision to take advantage of those ones, but similarly, we've got to be able to fund it as well if we're going to take advantage of those, those early prompt payment discounts. So the Trade Payables Control Account, and uh, the Trade Payables Control Account, or its various other names, you know, Purchase Ledger Control Account, um, you know, whatever you want, uh, Trade Creditors, and uh, it's the total of all creditors from suppliers at the current point in time. It's the total of all the purchase on credit, less any amounts paid to suppliers, credit notes received, and any early payment discounts uh, from suppliers that may have been taken advantage of. It's a tier account like other tier accounts in the General Ledger. The reason for the different names is simply that the names the names that have been given over time. You know, accountants of my generation use it as trade creditors, which has been trade to trade payables and the switch from the UK GAP to international financial reporting standards. Now, although this trade payables, uh, we've got this trade payables account here. Now, though, this is just a big dump. You know, if we sort of, you know, our final position is here. We don't actually know how many, which which suppliers that's made down, made up of, you know, and so it might be sort of five or six different suppliers really. In order to know who to pay, we have the, have the, um, the purchase ledger. So we have a purchase ledger, and that's simply again, a T account, a series of T accounts that makes up that amount of figure there. And you'll always be there looking to, to reconcile that, that uh, purchase ledger to a trade payables control account. In a digital system, it's gonna be automatic. You know, the, the posting's going to be to the, the purchase ledger uh, purchase ledger and also to the trade payables control account at the same time so that the computer won't make a mistake. It might be an incorrect posting but it'll still reconcile in there. In a manual system it's possible to have errors where you post one thing to the trade uh, you know, the trade payables control account and another thing to the purchase ledger and this often forms a question that you might have really. So in those questions you, you, you what you'll often get is um, a difference between the two amounts, the difference between the purchase ledger and the trade payables control account, so a different amount in there, and then you get a series of scenarios which one of them is responsible for this, this particular one. So how you do it is you create a four stage process, you know, total up the trade payables control account and the purchase ledger, determine the difference. Then for the scenario, 
create a journal that would have been created, that would have created that, that scenario. So they're going to give you a scenario, you're going to create what would that journal have been, what would it have posted. So let's say we say the scenario says it's been posted a £400 invoice once to the purchase ledger and twice to the virtual ledger control account and twice to the purchase ledger. So here we go, well, we've credited the purchase ledger control account 400 and credited the purchase ledger 800. So we're going to reverse that journal. Step three, we'll reverse that journal. We'll take it out on both sides there so we've not had not post this journal at all if the if the uh, the trade payables control account and the purchase ledger now reconcile to one another in here that is uh, the error if it's not then it's one of the other ones in the, in, this, in the a b c or d scenarios that you've been given here note that i'm using different terminology trade payables control account, trade purchase ledger control account and trade payables control account they're the same thing so So um, uh, we may provide remittance advices of payments to suppliers and the balance, and balance that we think that we owe the company. The supplier is going to check this to their sales ledger to see if there's any difference or any misunderstandings in there. So areas such as early payment discounts, missing invoices, transposition errors on invoices, good areas for exam questions where disputes might arise. So they might give you uh, remittance advice that you're producing and the sales ledger in the, in the other person's account or they might give you, you know, the purchase ledger on the remittance advice and see what you've missed basically you're just going to have those things but the remittance advice is what what the this the buyer uh, is is saying that they're paying so we're paying here so we've got a remittance advice here and we're saying that we've paid in full respect so we've paid everything really yeah and that's what we paid and you might have a sales ledger uh, account for but technical installation, this other company in here, Norton, Norton Computers, in there though, and they may have a different figures and say, well, what have they missed? You know, what invoices have they missed or what have you in there? Alternatively, they may have on their remittance advice that they've taken advantage of, or they've, they've done, they've, the, 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 actually, in this payment here, they've assumed that this is this is some form of, you know, there's a, there's a trade, uh, a prompt payment discount in there that might be calculated incorrectly. Now, suppliers might choose to chase uh, and you know, give reminders to their customers that, that they, you know, they, they owe money. Really. So, the supplier statement might be given to, to a buyer and here to remind them of the amounts due. So, we might have here, here's a supplier statement here, and, then, oh, and it's coming from Norton Computers in this instance here to this uh, to this customer, and it's saying, look, this is all the amounts that were due. And then you might need to sort of reconcile that to their account in the purchase ledger. Now, again, different sort of things you might want to have a look at. They may not have assumed there's some kind of uh, prompt payment discount uh, that's in there or what have you in there, or they may have missed off a payment, something like that. Really. Yeah, so, you know, we might have a payment within our purchase ledger uh, that, that actually is responsible for that. And they're saying that we haven't, they haven't received it yet. You know, that, that kind of thing you might, might, might be sort of going there and reminding them. So there'll be a lot of, lot of things, things like that. That there, but we're just reconciling one thing to another. The important thing to note is remittance advice is from the buyer to the seller. This is what I've paid, and the supplier statement is from the seller to the buyer. This is what you want. 